church committee was whether or not my sister, who is gay, would be welcome in this church. As my sister sat here last week, she loved the music, the bells, and the service as a whole. You see, my sister was raised in our home Disciples of Christ Church and has always felt very connected to her faith, but has struggled to find a place where her entire family feels comfortable and is welcome. My sister's partner of 13 years, Jane, has always been very supportive of my call to ministry. But in reality, she still feels a very deep kind of hurt when it comes to the word Christian. While I do not want to put words in Jane's mouth, I think most of us in this room can understand why she may feel the way she does when it comes to the church. The image of the church and Christian has been pretty nasty to those who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered. You see, I found out my sister was a lesbian around the age of 10. While I was not supposed to be told because I was so young, my sister ended up going ahead and telling me. In fact, I remember I had just learned the word lesbian the week before when I heard it on the news. And as a preteen, it was really strange to me at first. I mean, I was just learning all the ins and outs of romantic relationships. I was still in that, that's kind of gross stage. And my peers and my myriad of friends had preteen thoughts and discussions. And of course, being in the Bible Belt, those discussions included God's rules and plans as part of the conversation. I have been forever grateful that my sister told me she was a lesbian that early in my life. As my friends and others who would, would say cruel things about those who identify as GLBT, I had a face my sister's face, and I had a story that made it much more difficult for me to be hateful. In fact, I had someone that wasn't just a face or a story, I had someone I loved. How could I love, how could I, me, at 11, 12 years old, how could I love someone that God could not? That just didn't seem like a very nice God to me at 12 years old. And even when I hear people say, love the sinner, hate the sin argument, at 12 years old, I thought that was pretty lame. It didn't match what other those same people would say at other points. God has a plan and Jesus loves you and everyone else. It just didn't seem like God made any sense to me. God seemed very limited and very, very confusing to my 12-year-old self. You see, I would have probably left the church because of these same kind of messages long, long ago. And if it wasn't for church camp, and those weeks where my theological questions were not frowned upon, but embraced, I would probably not be standing here. You see, at church camp, I could learn and ask tough questions. And people didn't give me just easy black and white answers. They engaged with me in this place because it was a safe space. And within God's message, they reminded me most again and again that where there is love, there is God. That love and God are what needs to dominate in the message of God. And a loving God. A loving God was something powerful that I could understand and it became the foundational element for me to understand that God was not limited like these images I thought that other people were saying. God was big. God was amazing. God was able to love on much deeper levels. And you see, I share this story with you today. I share it with you not to change your minds or not to make you think about your faith the way that I think. I share this story because it's important for us to continue to share our stories, to share our stories that shape our faith, that challenge us and cause us to ask questions. I want you to understand why I believe the way I believe, 
But I also really want you to start sharing your stories with me so I can understand where you are on your faith journeys. How did you come into this room? How did you come to your understandings of God? When have your understandings of God been challenged, changed, strengthened? My image and understanding of God was also challenged at a different point and changed. When I realized that children understand God, innately they know God. But they do not know God in the same way that I see adults knowing God. There are children who do know God as they get older as a male image, but I've also seen children who need God as a mothering and female image. Or some don't need a male or a female image, they need more of a spirit, breath, wind type of image. And while I understand that for many, we use the male image of God as a way to communicate, and it has been for many then the most dominant and thus the most relational way to understand God. But I found myself all of a sudden needing to change that understanding so that I could provide for children ways to encounter and engage with God that was big enough for them to find a God they could connect to. A God that they could know and understand. Because many of them had relationships with a father or a mother or a significant other or an aunt or an uncle or a friend that were abusive, non-loving, and hurtful. So by limiting the image of God for these people, I was limiting their ability for children to connect to what they may need the most from God. You see, the image of God in a male-dominated society does not mean that when my daughter sits and finally grows into understanding God, she should feel less worthy than my son. God is not white or black or Asian. God is a variety of different colors and ideas and thoughts and movements. God is God. God is big. God is so wonderful. And God is sacred. Many cultures do not even name God. Because within the naming and identity and looking at God in a very specific way, we all of a sudden limit God. And so they keep the idea of God as nameless, holy, or the word we use when we pray, hallowed. In the Bible, God has many names and a variety of references. The images of God are not all male, female, or even personified. And while there are male images, if the image of the father type is how you relate and feel connected to God, then I want this to know that if father image is what works for you, keep it. Hold strong to it because that is your connection and the way that you connect to God. I would never want to take anyone's connection to God away from them. But I need to realize that we all connect to God in different ways. And I don't want to limit children and teens who are learning about those connections. That's why I spend a lot of time in working with children finding many ways to express the majesty of God. So they who already know God can continue to know God throughout their lives. Over the summer, we will be revisiting some of the foundational first stories of our faith. On Sunday, May 29th, we will be having our first study worship service. The following weeks will include sermons and worship services based around the discussion that takes place when we revisit the biblical stories of Genesis as adults. I have done this with other adults, and I have found that each person all of a sudden is forced to rethink their childhood understanding of creation and Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah all of a sudden they're opened up in a much bigger way and you realize they're really adult stories that lead to deep foundational discussions and questions. And so as we move to that, I just needed to set up for you some of the foundation of where I come from, but let you know I want to know where you come from as we begin these discussions. I thought about calling today's sermon, Why Does She Do That? And while I haven't done it here, I also wanted to let you know that I've been cheating. Usually when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I refer to God as Creator or Beloved. 
And it's been really weird for three or four months to always start it out as our father for you. It all of a sudden disconnects me because that's not the image that works more, most profoundly for me. But I didn't want to take you out of the prayer. So I need to let you know probably from now on I might start that way so that I can feel my connection. But I want you to start however you feel your connection to God. I also want you to know that I change the words to things all the time. I change the words to praise God, the Son, and Holy Ghost. I make just God two syllable notes, or I change it to what I learned in another church, praise God with all the hosts above, praise God with wonder, joy, and love. And that's just a way for me to keep God big. You know, and I also have noticed when people move away from both even male and female images of God, they get more creative and poetic when describing God as the greatest artist and writer and creator of all times, God, the Almighty, gracious, merciful, loving, hopeful, peacemaker, and more. We all of a sudden move outside of the box we put God in and realize that God really is so big. And that's why we're here, to worship a big, majestic, powerful, amazing, loving, forgiving God. I do not think today's sermon should change how you choose to connect to God or even some of your understandings. I do not. I just wanted to take some time to explain to you that the message of God's love that starts in Leviticus and it continues all the way to the end of the Bible comes back to me again and again as the foundational element of how I understand God. And I will tell you honestly, if someone were to stand in a pulpit and preach to me the exact opposite of how God is only male, it would be really hard for me to sit in a pew. But instead, I would then find myself having to challenge that person to conversation, to all of a sudden engage so that I wasn't closing off my understanding and images either, that I want to walk into these difficult discussions with you. But I want to walk in not because of opinions or pride or righteous indignation. I want us to all walk into these conversations with a curiosity like the boy in my book. The boy just seeking to understand because just like me and just like you and just like the boy, I don't have all the right answers. I just have a book that I try to follow as I ask the big questions. I, like you, am just trying to understand how big God really is. Isn't that we, what we are all trying to do? So I want you to walk in, ready to share and hear stories that put faiths, realities, and God in places and images that you may not expect. You may find that God is bigger than you or I can ever imagine. And we may all spend time learning about how God moves in new ways. And for a long time, I struggled with those who didn't agree with some of my ideas, and I really struggled with those who didn't agree with women in ministry. My call felt so clear that it's still strange to hear when people argue how I was wrong. I've heard on more than one occasion as a woman standing in the pulpit, I must be influenced and tempted by the devil. Now as I've gotten older, I've said, oh good, I'm not supposed to be a minister. I can do something that makes more money. But instead, I actually have found I don't struggle as much with those who are blatant about it. It's some of the subtle things that have been much more difficult. But those who are blatant about it are connected to God in a way that I am not. And while I find it to be limiting, and I find it to be hurtful, until they are ready to take God outside of a box and see God in bigger ways, then I cannot help them. And actually, I've started to pray for them more, and I feel sorry for them. Because there is so much more love and beauty when all of the colors of the rainbow and light and God are able to be present. That God is more powerful when people find ways to love beyond limits. That means I even have to love those who think the devil has called me. How will they ever know love if I just in return hurt them? I have to love those who see the church as a place of hurt. Even though for me, it's been a place of empowerment. I have to love my enemies. I have to love those who are different than me. I have to love my neighbors. 
and those who disagree with me, I have to love. Because as I said to the kids earlier, that's what we're called to do. Because God is love. But love is hard. So how big? How big are we able to love? How big is God's love? How big is your God? You see, God is so big. Part of you, part of me. God's part of the stars, the oceans, and trees. God is in heaven, but God moves around. And all good things, and good things are love. God can be found.